Hey everyone, before we get into things, if you missed the recent announcement, my second channel, Ant Dude Plays, is back up and running. And it's gonna be the home for looser, more lightly edited content that'll be uploaded a lot more frequently. So if you want more stuff to watch in between these bigger Ant Dude episodes, that is the place for you. Already got some videos on there with plenty more on the way, so stay tuned and thanks for your support. Time to talk about Pikmin. Ah, oh, would you look at that? Looks like the plot line to Pikmin 4. Oh, who am I kidding? We're never getting Pikmin 4. We will continue this Pikmin marathon with Pikmin 4. That game exists. It's totally gonna happen. We swear. It's never gonna happen, is it? I'll never complain about anything ever again. I'm still not convinced Pikmin 4 actually exists, man. I've beaten this game, okay? I've seen the title screen, I pressed a bunch of buttons for hours, and then the credits rolled, and even still, I'm just gonna keep falling back to that 2015 article about the game nearing completion and joke about it never releasing. That's, that's all I know. But, negative. All jokes aside, it is 2023 and... Here it is! Pikmin 3, originally released on the Wii U in 2013. It's been- it- it- it's been 10 years! Almost to the day, too. July 13th for 3 in Japan, July 21st for 4 worldwide. Oh, oh, wow. Man, a wait like that? It can only be rivaled by, like, Kingdom Hearts 3? But hell, at least before then, fans got these incredibly divisive handheld games to keep them busy. Oh. We're really gonna keep talking trash about Hey Pikmin when it brought us the crumb bug? Come on. The wait to get to this point has been excruciating. It didn't help that when the game was first revealed, Miyamoto gave us a tease out of direct and then said, oh no, we're gonna talk about Bloom instead. That was mean. That was mean and I still don't forgive him. At the very least, the past couple years, they have been pretty fruitful. Yes, that was an intentional pun. Dude, the Pikmin fans kept taking over Times Square in New York City. You guys... <laughs> you guys are amazing. Back when I previously talked about the Pikmin series with my oh-so-cleverly-titled themed months of A La March and Alfpril, still clever names by the way, it was all around the time rumors were starting to circulate about a Switch port of Pikmin 3. Well, it took well over a year after that last video went out, but hey, Pikmin 3 Deluxe. This release is actually very important to the context of Pikmin 4, because for many people, this was their very first introduction to the series. And boy, this can also easily be argued as the Wii U to Switch port with the most amount of changes. Everything's been consolidated to one screen now, meaning you no longer have to look at a separate device to see the map finally. We got difficulty options, multiple save states, achievements with the badge system, the Piccolopedia from Pikmin 2 is back, story mode can be played in co-op, all of the original DLC is included, and there is a brand new slate of side story missions where you get to play as Olimar before and after the events of the main story. There's a lot. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a whole range of other smaller changes too, but content-wise, Deluxe is clearly the best way to play that game. Even though they did randomly update the Switch's icon to change the logo to match what they are going forward with with 4 and the releases of 1 and 2 on Switch, but... okay. Finally, less flowers. Now Pikmin will sell more. However, the controls end up being a more interesting conversation. For the longest time, I used to champion the Wii Remote controls hardcore for these games. Clearly, they're the best way to play them, right? The precision and the ability to move your captain and the cursor independently simply could not be matched with just analog sticks. Thankfully, gyro aiming does provide a perfect middle ground where you can do big movements with the analog stick and be more precise with the motion controls. It's still a shame that gyro technology is not as precise as the pointer technology we had 15 years ago, but man, you know what? Considering all of the other quality of life improvements that Deluxe brought to the table, I will still take this over kinking my neck constantly to look at the gamepad any day. But this controller topic is definitely further exacerbated with the Switch ports of Pikmin 1 and 2, used to celebrate the upcoming release of Pikmin 4. And yeah, there's gyro in these versions because they're based off of the Wii versions, but it's only when you're throwing a Pikmin or using the whistle, so not as fluid. You're not able to point anywhere and everywhere like in the Wii versions or in 3 Deluxe, because as it turns out, Pikmin 4 would take on that same exact control scheme. So, yeah, it all makes sense now. So for 1 and 2, I'm still not a huge fan of the GameCube versions, I adore the Wii versions, and I do accept that the Switch versions are likely the definitive ones now. Still great controls, minor improvements to how the game handles, brand new videos for the enemy roll call at the end of Pikmin 1, newly rendered cutscenes for Pikmin 2, just having these games portable? Dude, the Switch now has the entire main Pikmin quadrilogy available on it, and that just makes me so damn happy. Any complaints I have are just null and void because this is a great time for Pikmin fans. 
Hey, never mind. They got rid of the Duracell batteries in Pikmin 2. You know, okay, I take, I take it back. The Switch versions are terrible. It's probably best for consistency if I cover all my bases first before we finally get to talk about this seminal title. Uh, there was Pikmin Bloom. I mean, that that happened. Uh, you know, it, it, it seemed like it'd be a great success after Pokemon Go, but I just, I can't be bothered. There's only so many times I can walk around and, and Bloom Pikmin that it just gets tiring. Even though I did get the Ochi costume. The Ochi costume's nice. And also, doy, how stupid of me. When I made that video on Hey Pikmin, you know, the 3DS game, I forgot to mention the 3DS Pikmin killer app. Photos with Pikmin. Where you can take photos of the Pikmin. Listen, if I didn't talk about everything before talking about Pikmin 4, I would be called a Pikmin fraud. And I'm never gonna allow that to happen, okay? Never again. All right, no more fooling around. It's time for the main event. I can't believe I'm gonna be saying this, but let's talk about Pikmin 4. You guys see all those great review scores for the game, except for GameSpot 7 out of 10, stating that only the Dandori segments were the negative? Seems like a uh, genuine Dandori issue, that's all I'm saying. Going into this brand new adventure, there was one major concern from the community. Are the events of Pikmin 4 retconning the events of the previous games? Are we really caring about the deep Pikmin continuity now? So things start off telling the story of Olimar crashing a ship and finding a Pikmin, but C, it mentions him discovering the Pikmin as if they're brand new things. And also there's a dog this time, Moss. I don't like how she's looking at me. Quite frankly, Olimar's probably hit his head so many times during these ship crashes, his memory could just be playing tricks on him. Soon enough, the real plot shows itself. As a member of the Rescue Corps, which also crashed on the planet, dear God, invest in some ship R&D. It is up to you, as your own created character, a series first, and I love this so much, to find and rescue not only Captain Olimar, but the rest of your crew, as well as dozens and dozens of other castaways. I guess this is kind of a retcon of Pikmin 1, perhaps this slips the game's story before the events of 2 and 3, but honestly, that was never a concern of mine. Your ship crashes, you can grow these little guys to collect a bunch of stuff, deal with a little bit of nightmare fuel, it's still a Pikmin game at the end of the day. Where it fits in the timeline, that... what, whatever. There are also these three castaways that you find that I guess are related to the captains from 3. They look the same, they have the same color scheme, but they're not the same characters. I... I don't know, maybe that means something. At the end of the day, if any story implications change the course of the franchise going forward, I don't really care, as long as we don't have to wait another 10 years for the next game. If anything, I'm more satisfied by the decision to add a full cast of characters to the Pikmin universe, finally. Before, the cast of characters never really developed beyond, oh hey, these guys are from a different planet than Hakatate. The company has a president now that goes, <laughs> Olimar gets adorable little messages from his wife who almost looks exactly like him, and I don't know, that's kind of weird when you think about it, it looks exactly like him but with different hair, that's, that's weird, but hey, you do you. But here, yeah, we got a whole crew. The new head captain, Shepard, the gear inventor, Russ, the badass dingo, Colin, and that doesn't include all of the other little humanoids that are just there. They're these random NPCs with a little bit of backstory that you can talk to back at your home base because, oh yeah, there's a home base now too. A safe space to grow a couple extra Pikmin, purchase some items and gear, start up brand new side quests from these new characters, explore the treasure guide and the returning Piclopedia. Oh, thank God that's back. I do love the feeling of isolation the previous games had. It gave off a real Metroid vibe exploring this wild and dangerous planet all by yourself. Louis doesn't count, but interacting with the other members of your crew and seeing the base slowly expand with each new castaway found, it's really satisfying. It certainly handled the whole expanding the cast with likable characters thing a lot better than Metroid did, I can tell you that much. Listen, alright, I share the same name as the Remember Me guy from Metroid Other M. I have reason to be salty. In classic Pikmin fashion, hop into your ship, pick your level of choice, and take off. Oh. Oh, holy sh**, this game is pretty. So back when Miyamoto first revealed the game after putting me through the five stages of grief in like two minutes, the only thing that was mentioned was that the camera angle was gonna be different. Dead, you know, I, oh man, Pikmin fans dealt with a lot that day. But yeah, sure enough, Gone is the more traditional top-down perspective in favor of a more behind the back feel, likely due to needing a control scheme where motion-based pointing was secondary rather than primary. This was my main fear going into this game, but damn it, you know, it's no surprise here, it's Nintendo, it took them forever to make the game, but it works. There is a very generous lock-on now. The cursor will lock on to important things, whether you like it or not. I thought it would be a bit much, and maybe the option to turn it off would be nice, but man, 
this just works too. I was always able to lock onto the thing I wanted, but if it didn't, then I can just cycle through the available choices and that works too. Oh yeah, there's also a dog. Introducing Ochi. I will die for him. You see, unlike Pikmin 2 and 3, there's only one playable captain, so multitasking is certainly not as important as the last few games, but the inclusion of Ochi adds a shocking amount of depth to the core gameplay. He can dig, attack, and bring treasures back to the ship, just like a Pikmin. If you're separated, he does basically act like a second fully playable captain, which is cool, but you can also ride on top of him, and all of your Pikmin will latch onto dear life alongside you. You're able to charge him forward when he's next to you, but if you're on top, you can charge an enemy with all of your Pikmin and they will immediately jump on and start munching away. He can even be powered up back at the base, allowing him to carry heavier items, he can attack stronger, he can swim, he can jump? Pikmin with the jump button? Oh my god! Ochi is great. Easy contender for one of the best dogs ever made. With those slight changes in mind, once you get into the groove of things, yeah, it's, it's more Pikmin. These levels are gigantic now and bring a level of verticality never before seen in this series. The mix of the new camera angle, Ochi's jump button, and even some climbable surfaces for the first time. You can get a view of this world in a brand new way. Easily the most gorgeous and expansive locations the franchise has seen yet and one of the best looking games Nintendo has ever done. Dude, there's a house now. Finally, what the franchise has always been missing. Couches. Ice Pikmin. Ice Pikmin! Dude, it's like if the Rock Pikmin were light blue, it's awesome. I love these new guys. They can freeze water so you can walk over it in peace, and you can also freeze enemies in place, meaning they get completely obliterated instead of just killed. Oh my god. There are also some things that hardcore fans might initially see as drawbacks. For one, you have to earn your way to the usual 100 Pikmin limit now. You start off with only 20. Well, on the surface at least, but we'll get to that. And only through finding bulbs of... Fl 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 flarlick, flarlick, can you take out 10 additional carrot guys. While on paper that does seem like a downgrade to me, this just means that the game moves at a faster pace. The earlier stages include barely any puzzles that require a massive army. It eliminates the typical early Pikmin gameplay loop of just grinding out some pellets and enemies to get to 100 as fast as humanly possible. You can still grow those Pikmin, they'll just stay in the onion, which means when you get the flarlick, you'll have another 10 ready to go immediately. And on top of that, you don't even need to think about who goes in your army anymore. There's an auto button that just gives you the ideal loadout which, outside of a few select instances, was exactly what I needed in that level. And hell, you can't even take out more than three Pikmin types at a single time. In total, there are eight types to choose from, with every main type returning, as well as, of course, the new ice ones. But yeah, only three can be out at once. My guess is that this is to limit any feelings of being overwhelmed with options here, because eight Pikmin types, holy cow, that's a lot. And honestly, I feel like some people forget that for the majority of Pikmin 3, you only had access to reds, yellows, and rocks. It isn't until pretty far into the game where it remembers, oh yeah, we have, uh, we have winged ones now, have fun with that. And then when you get the blues, like, the game ends. There were barely any instances of needing more than three at a single time, so I'm not just saying this to be a hardcore defender, the game never requires you to have more than three. Just know that even though it sounds like a downgrade, it's fine. And besides, the gameplay loop isn't like Pikmin 3 this time around, it's more like Pikmin 2. And that's thanks to the glorious return of Caves. Oh thank god the caves are back, true happiness can finally be achieved. Is that an Emperor Bulblax coming at me at full speed? The caves in Pikmin 2 were a fairly divisive feature. Sure, they made the game a whole lot longer, but many of them had very uninteresting level designs. With most of them being randomly generated, it took Pikmin from a stressful time management strategy game to more of a dungeon crawler with some light puzzle elements. Now don't get me wrong, I did really enjoy the caves, especially the submerged castle have no problems and no trauma there. Even still, there was a lot of room for improvement. So fast forward and uh, yeah, this is basically why Pikmin 4 is the best one now. Actual level designs for the caves, yes! Each one not only has a unique gimmick to set it apart, but they're also all meticulously designed to be special in their own different ways. Whether it be based off of specific elements, specific enemies, specific puzzle gimmicks, maybe a special boss fight, the caves here are way more interesting than they ever were in 2. It is not even close. It's uh, sort of like when Persona went from simple grid-based dungeons in 4 to the fully-fledged worlds in 5. There you go. That comparison is sure to make someone happy. I just want to get my social rank with Brittany to an S, okay? Also, that whole auto thing from before, that also applies here. You can select your loadouts as you're entering the cave and as you exit back to the surface. So no more going to a cave and the cave is like, oops, idiot, you need all reds for this one. Go back to the ship, idiot, dummy. There's none of that. 
What's also cool about the caves is you're not sticking to the Pikmin limit. You may be growing your limit constantly up on the surface and it takes a while to get to 100, but underground? Hey, if you find more Pikmin, they're part of your crew. Use them however you wish. It doesn't matter, because remember, when you go back to the surface, you're selecting your loadout again, back to the limit. Like I said, it's a system that works. And suck it, hey Pikmin haters, you're collecting Sparklium in this one, the same collectible from that game. Must really hurt, doesn't it? And yes, this all means the return of treasures as well, with damn near anything you can think of being considered a quote unquote treasure. There is so much, there, there is so much, there is so much in this game. Because the caves are also where you find all of the castaways, and combining those with all of the stuff you can also get on the surface, there is way more stuff to collect than in all of the previous Pikmin games combined. It's crazy. And hell, some of those castaways are random. Kinda. It's interesting how this works out, since some of the castaways are pretty important to plot progression in order to not penalize you for enjoying the freedom of jumping around between different levels and caves as you wish, you will always get the same castaways in the same order, regardless of whatever cave you go into, which is pretty cool. Also, unlike in 2, time does still progress in the caves, just a whole lot slower, about one-sixth of the speed. It's not like it really matters, a day is not gonna end while you're in the caves, you may just come back up during the 10 second countdown. It may not seem like that big of a deal, but with time still passing and there being way more stuff to do on the surface than there ever was in Pikmin 2, there is still a bit of a fun challenge to plan out your days for peak optimization, even if there is no overarching ominous time limit. And if the lack of a stressful time limit is that big of a bother to you, then let me counteract it. The bread bugs are back, and they sing the theme of the bread bug dungeon from Pikmin 2. If you start complaining about the bread bugs, I swear to god, Aw oh, man, and the references, dude. There are references aplenty. I love these so much. The Game Boy Advance SP at the start of the game is just the tip of the iceberg, man. You can get the cartridges for Kudu Kudu Kududin, the Famicom mini cart of Shin Onigashima. Oh my god, Nintendo remembered Wave Race Blue Storm? Aw oh, dude, and the music toys that play songs like the lullaby from Mario 64, that's great. There's this puzzle that you slowly build up by collecting a bunch of pieces throughout the entire game, and it's the picture of the Nintendo dog Dachshund? That dog's really gotten around. I mean, sure, obviously not every treasure is some big reference, and there's no real life items like the Duracell battery in 2, which once again, they got rid of in the Switch version anyway, Still kind of upset about that, but still, it's fine. It's not like I'm getting super excited about collecting the hot dog octopus anyway. Okay, that's a lie, they're totally adorable. But really now, if you do want some of that classic stressful Pikmin gameplay, there is learning the art of Dandori. Which by the way, turns out, totally a real Japanese word, so I'm glad to see Nintendo teaching gamers some culture. Flashback to when Miyamoto actually threw the word out during some Pikmin 3 hype. Look at that, it's like the prophecy foretold. It roughly translates to the art of time management and planning, which yeah, that definitely defines Pikmin. But since 4 overall is a lot more chill than the previous games, Dandori takes the form of these timed challenges where you either clear a level of all of its enemies and treasures, or in these timed battles, where you have to outperform your opponent by grabbing more items than them, with, of course, plenty of ways to screw them over with specific item attacks or even this big old bomb that will knock points away from the receiver's onion if you can bring it over to it. Unlike earlier Pikmin games, there is no traditional challenge mode that's separate from the main campaign, but this clearly is what replaces is that. The same goes for the multiplayer. Dandori Battle is the multiplayer mode. I mean, it's no bingo battle from 3, I'll be honest, but it's still really good and plenty chaotic, which is really all I want. Except for also having a bingo board because man, that mode is still, that is still peak right there. And having these challenge segments as part of the main story this time around is pretty genius. It adds a lot more variety and uncertainty to what a cave could contain. And you get ranked on these too, and getting a platinum is pretty damn tough in the later challenges. The computer AI for the battles actually ramps up quite significantly. It's awesome. And on top of all of that, if you want even more gameplay variety, don't worry, Pikmin 4's got you. You can explore at night for the first time ever. That is so sick. Legends always used to tell that in the world of Pikmin, the night was terrifying and you would always see these bulb orbs and whatever enemies come out and eat up any Pikmin that you so dare leave behind. Now I get to go into that? I get to go into that dangerous pit? Oh God. 
So the way night expeditions work, it's essentially a mission mode. Each of the main levels has a few of them, and the goal is totally different than the core gameplay. Instead, with your time limit, you have to protect these special mounds of dirt, known as luminals, in order to receive medicine to heal the leaflings, these sort of corrupted castaways that you will find from the Dandori Caves. These segments also introduce another new Pikmin, the Glow Pikmin. Also very cute, love them. They make uh, they make spectral little noises this time around, and they're like ghosts. It's, it's really cool, I, I like them a whole lot. And these are the only ones that you can use during the night. You grow more by bringing back to the base these uh, Mario Galaxy star bits and Skyward Sword grass attitude crystals. Okay, it's like, it's just a star candy that they really like in Japan, and Nintendo puts them in multiple games, and now they're in Pikmin now, so that's, that's kind of cool. They can teleport instantaneously to you, making it a lot more fun to multitask with them, since you don't have to worry about rallying them back. And while they can't attack like normal, they can also group up into a giant ball and stun whoever you throw them on. These guys are awesome. That attack is very important because the enemies at night are ruthless. You know, for a few seconds everything is good, but then their eyes start to glow red with death as their only goal and they will beeline it to your luminals by any means necessary. You can set up these little ones along their way to buy yourself some time, but they're gonna take those things out too. It almost turns Pikmin into a tower defense game, which is actually a great fit for the series strategy roots. And the word roots? Yes, that is indeed a plant pun. And like I said, the glow Pikmin you can only use at night. So while you can't use all the ones that you're growing back up in the traditional gameplay style on the surface, you will gain glow seeds that you can use to summon some to replace the ones that you've lost once you're in the caves, and even transform them into normal Pikmin if you throw them into a candy bud, ultimately giving you a pretty solid reward for doing these segments outside of just simply needing to do them for some of the story. I really like these night expeditions. I guess it would be kind of cool to have a full-on level that was just at night but this is still a perfectly acceptable and really, really fun and challenging mission mode. Though, I'm pretty sure the Glow Pikmin are why we didn't get the return of the Bulbman and, like... <laughs> I'll be okay. It's not... it's not that big of a loss. I'm just really gonna miss the kids that I adopted by force because I killed their only living guardian. Dude! Okay, the amount of quality of life improvements to the typical formula here is insane. It took 10 years to develop Pikmin 4, and damn it, they made sure every single one of those years counted. Items like the bomb rocks and the brand new freeze rocks are no longer required to be held by a Pikmin. You now grow an inventory of them and you can pull them out whenever you want, and you, as the captain, will throw them. If an item that you want to bring back to your ship has a minimum count of Pikmin that you need to carry it back, there will be a slight pause after chucking Pikmin at it to ensure that you exclusively throw that minimum first before adding more to it if you so choose. And if there are more than the minimum carrying an item back, you can do a short whistle on it to pull back the excess, and the rest will go on about their business. If there's a chunk of items that need to be carried back to base, once all of those items are gone, the Pikmin will remain at the base instead of just chilling where the chunk was originally found. Thank you. You can also move the base around between a few different points on the surface now, which is awesome since those levels are a whole lot bigger than ever before. The Pikmin will auto-carry the items that fly out of broken gates and defeated enemies. The super spicy spray is back and it will affect every Pikmin out on the field, even if they're not directly next to you, including Ochi, he gets the effect too. If you throw Pikmin at enemies, you'll prioritize the flower ones, which are the stronger ones, but if you throw them at nectar, you'll prioritize the leaves, the weaker ones, which is fantastic. Flower pellets will only show the colors of whichever Pikmin Pikmin you have out at that time. Every single Pikmin, even the ones outside of your immediate group, will follow you to the next floor of a cave. Thank God. In general, the Pikmin are way smarter than ever when it comes to following paths. They finally manage to share more than one brain cell this time and they don't get stuck on walls and bridges and ramps. Oh my God, that's amazing. They're finally not idiots. Inactive Pikmin that are just standing there can be made active by just walking next to them instead of needing to whistle them or touch them skin to skin. There's a brand new rewind ability that can be used for as little as a minute back rather than needing to reset an entire day, which is great for newcomers who don't want to replay a large portion of gameplay due to a stupid decision that causes a bunch of Pikmin to die all out of nowhere. But if you want to stomach all those deaths because you're a maniac, you can easily just not use it if you want that challenge. God, and the Pikmin will sing music from the previous games if you just walk around with them. Ah! It's so cute! Wow, this game took 10 years to develop? No way. Dude, like I went back to Pikmin 3 Deluxe right after beating Pikmin 4 and wow, they are they are so much dumber in 3. It's it's crazy. Whew, okay. 
Let's take a step back, not to be a bigger fanboy than I'm already being, but let's be real, there are a couple of downsides. For one, enemies no longer respawn on the surface, only underground. Doesn't matter how many days pass after you kill them, they're gonna stay dead. Sure, you can still grind a couple of pellets every single day at your base, but still, an odd choice for those who like to grind out Pikmin a bunch when you have some free time. Although a new addition, every single Pikmin has its own onion now that you can find, which is kinda cool. Next up, while the game does look incredibly gorgeous, I will be real, it is kind of a shame that it doesn't randomly rain like it did in Pikmin 3. Clearly, not a big deal, but it was really cool when it happened back there because, like, the weather was different, the mood was different, the music was slightly different. It was nice, it was a nice bit of atmosphere, and it would have been nice here too. There's no photo mode like 3 had either. Like, listen, this game is great and all, but clearly we're missing out on the vibes here. Oh man, the tutorial. Yeah, the tutorial is very, very long, is a, is a lot of text, and like, man, if you're reading all of that text, it takes almost an hour before they finally let the shackles off, and even then, text boxes still pop up from time to time after that. It's... It's a, it's, a, it's a lot. Thankfully, a majority of it can be skipped, so on multiple playthroughs, you don't have to worry about it, but it's certainly alarming if this is your very first Pikmin game. There is a lot of text. And then, if you're a bit of a Pikmin vet like I am, you may also think the game is a bit too easy. A good majority of the time with these enemies, if you just charge them with Ochi, and you have a bunch of Ice Pikmin with you, they will freeze the enemy, and then you have a couple extras to attack it, and before you know it, that enemy is frozen and dead in no time. This makes enemies and bosses not feel anywhere near as threatening as they used to. Considering this game is clearly very similar to Pikmin 2, which had that spray that would turn enemies into rocks, it's not too different than that, but still, it's pretty easy. You could just not use these things, but come on, be real. There's also a bit of a lack of variety in terms of the bosses, like a lot of them just boil down to it's a normal enemy, but bigger. You still never know what you're gonna get when you jump into a cave for the first time, but overall, it's definitely lacking a bit in terms of having these really big boys that have you go, Oh god, I'm screwed. Now granted, considering we are using Pikmin 2 as a base, you gotta remember, that game had a lot of bullshit, and I do not think that is what we should go back to. Some of the late game challenges definitely require some extra thought power, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the lack of a super spicy difficulty mode like 3 Deluxe introduced, maybe having a smaller Pikmin limit and a less powerful Ochi charge so you can't just cheese enemies all the time, would have been a nice reward for beating the game the first time. It also doesn't help that some of the Pikmin kind of feel underutilized too. Getting a whole 8 Pikmin to work with in your stable, I guess it was inevitable, and while they're not totally used, Useless, it definitely feels like the wind Pikmin could have had some more use rather than feeling like oh, they're just a means to carry treasures in a different way. That's, that's kind of what they boil down to for most of the game. Also, the music is kind of mid, and that's upsetting. Like, it's very atmospheric and clearly fitting, but we're missing a lot of the memorable melodies like those found in the previous games. 1, 2, and 3 also had a lot of atmospheric music, but there were some catchy melodies to support those. And here in 4? I mean, the title screen is sick, but I cannot for the life of me remember the tunes for any of the levels. And that's a shame. There's no amiibo support, which is just upsetting because the franchise has the best amiibo under its belt. There are no achievements like there were in 3 Deluxe, which I thought were a great addition. I mean, why not? They were there before. You, you made that a special thing that wasn't in 3, but was in 3 Deluxe, but not here. Okay. Now obviously, I'm not gonna claim that any of this really hampers the overall game experience because it's still a fantastic game from start to finish, but these are some things that I hope a patch could fix in the future. Oh yeah, there's also co-op in this game, but... No, no it's not. Like the achievements, they made sure to add full co-op to Pikmin 3 Deluxe. And here, it's just like the Mario Galaxy co-star mode. No thanks. Hopefully this can be addressed too. Fingers crossed. Ah man, who cares, this is still one of the best games Nintendo's ever made. But now, I think enough time has passed. It's time for the spoiler section. Which, real quick, uh, can I just say how crazy it is that there is a spoiler section for a Pikmin game anyway? Like, in the previous titles, the, the spoilers really boil down to what the ending looked like, and Louis a piece of sh We got a lot left to talk about, so let's get to it. Louis is a piece of sh Wow, you finally saved Captain Olimar, and then you let the credits roll, only to be met with a Louis jump scare. God damn it. So yes, just like in Pikmin 2, where you fixed your company's debt and then you had to go back for Louis, here you save Olimar and then you have to go back for Ochi. You gotta fix him up and get that leaf on his tail completely eliminated so he can come back home with the rescue corps. And, and Louis just happens to be there too. When you're done with the credits and you continue on with the game, you get two more full levels to explore, with a few caves in each, as well as some Dandori segments where... Uh... I guess Louis is completely cracked out at this stuff? 
Whenever you fight Leafling Olimar in the campaign, he's like, oh man, I don't know if you could possibly beat me, wink emoji, while Louie is just here wrecking my life. Oh my god. Uh, good, good, good for him? I guess, I, I didn't know he was good at this stuff. Outside of the main campaign, freeing Olimar also unlocks his shipwreck tail, which is basically just Pikmin 1 again, but with the Pikmin 4 skin. Like, it's not like the Olimar missions in 3 Deluxe that just feel like, hey, uh, this time you play as Olimar. No, the shipwreck tail really makes things feel different. You got 30 ship parts that you need to collect. You only have red, blue, and yellow Pikmin at your disposal. There's no dog for a while until you find Moss partway through, and you have not a 30, but a 15 day limit. So the pressure is on at all times. The levels may be the same, but the enemies, they're different. This is incredible. Perhaps this story is what does add a lot more fuel to the idea of this retconning the events of the actual first game, but again, I don't care. This mode is awesome. These sorts of limitations are something I think a theoretical hard mode for the main campaign so interesting. Because I did the shipwreck tale, and I just wanted more of that. Plus, one of the bosses is the Emperor of Bulblax, and you get the piggy bank out of him which is amazing. And the ending of it is basically the same as the first game too. Oh, it's so, oh, it's so, so good. The music is also better for these stages too. A lot of the songs sound like these remixes and combinations of songs from one and two, which is incredibly fitting and really adds to this mode's different vibe. Also, by the way, kind of off topic, but uh, bro, they brought the Smoky Prog back? God. God! And then after that, once you finish the shipwreck tale, then you unlock the Trial of the Sage Leaf, a series of 10 incredibly challenging Dandori levels. And throughout them, you get rewarded with a white and a purple onion. The first time those two Pikmin types have ever had them, meaning you can grind those types up on the surface for the first time. That's so cool. Really fun and expansive extra levels, one of which includes a beady long legs jump scare. Oh god, they include these greatly challenging caves, you have Olimar's shipwreck tail, the trial of the sage leaf. Obviously the game isn't done when the first set of credits roll, so whether you call this the post game or the end game, it doesn't matter. This all rounds out Pikmin 4 to be one of the most content dense games Nintendo has ever produced. That's sure, DLC would be great to get even more to do, but at its base price, it is hard to do better than this. It took me 35 hours to beat this game. Oh my god, that's so much and I want to do it all over again. <sighs> all right, let's talk about the cavern for a king. This is the final dungeon, which of course is an insane gauntlet and it's pretty challenging. And at the end, hey, look at that. You find Louie, who had kicked the moss to the curb because of course he did, he's a jerk. And he also somehow tamed this thing. Man, the ancient sire hound. This is such a good final fight. I love that this dog theme is carried out throughout so many elements of the game. Hey, that main ship that you're bringing all the treasure back to, that's the SS Beagle. It makes sense now why that puzzle that you're collecting is the Nintendo. Your captain, her name is Shepard. Of course, there's Ochi and Moss, they're definitely dog coded. So yeah, to end off with this incredibly huge furball in the longest and most complex fight in the series, ah, uh, it's the perfect finale for this adventure. Once all of this is said and done, Louis is taken back by force. He should never be allowed outside again. The sire hound goes about its business. Ochi is fixed up, able to return with the crew, and Moss sort of becomes the new leader of the Pikmin, which is a pretty cool character arc for a dog thing. You know, they are dog coded, but I don't really know what these things are. Eh, at least they're pretty cute. And then some extra little bonus, once you're done with that, you get some side quests from Louis, where you gather a bunch of enemies in the caves because he wants to make a soup or something? I don't, I don't know, man, Louis, Louis sucks. I'm so happy the Piclopedia is back, man, because Louis's entries for everything are just the most unhinged things. You go to the Glow Pikmin and he's like, doesn't smell alive. <laughs> God. God, I hate Louis so much. And strangely enough, finishing this Louis quest unlocks the ability for you to carry back stuff to the base yourself, like with your own bare hands. This isn't really helpful at this point of the game, which I guess is a fitting reward coming from Louie. Thanks, you son of a- But yeah, that's... That's Pikmin 4. Easily one of the best games Nintendo's ever made. You know, no big deal, I guess. Call it a bias, call it me being a Nintendo fanboy, call it whatever you want. Pikmin is one of the best franchises this company has ever developed. The four mainline games are all incredible for their own reasons. You can make an argument as to why each and every one of them is the best one, and you would all be correct. 
Having them all on Switch as well is amazing for accessibility because I know there are plenty of people who are playing Pikmin 1 and 2 for the first time and experiencing that nah, these games aren't cozy. They're actually incredibly difficult and they hate you. They just hate you and want you to die. And I don't care, man. I'm still a fan of Hey Pikmin. That game's cute. We got those short movies. There are more people exposed to Pikmin than ever. There's a ton of new merchandise available, which is awesome because they're all great. Look at this Ice Pikmin ice tray. It's, it's amazing. It's all just so... So good, man. It took a long time to get here, like a long time, but damn it, Pikmin 4 delivered in not only every possible way, but better. And I could not be happier. And with that, I'll end it off with one final question to ponder over. When's Pikmin 5? I'm tired of waiting.